so much of you and, and how people know you in the music is this house. Right. So in a way, it kind of works. And I think that, that people want, what, you know, seeing you in your home where you've sat where, or where you're Right. Office. I get it. But there's also a uh, – well, I had this weird experience many years ago. And I've told – I mean, I've told the story before. But I had a guy, a runaway kid who showed up and he was <clears> – <throat> He had been, he's from, he's a Mormon, he's from Utah and he had left the church and he was really, um, very angry at the church and he had run away and he stayed here for a couple of weeks or something, or he was, tra- I don't know if he was traveling or run away, but anyway, he showed up and he stayed here and then he came back a couple of times. He would show up again and he was, you know, people crashed here all the time. This, you know, we were moving to this house in 81, so it was pretty regular, like revolving door in terms of who was staying here. And um, he was really uh, frustrated with the church and he had, he was agonizing over the fact that his girlfriend was still in the church and that they couldn't be together because he wasn't, like he wasn't, he didn't identify as a Mormon anymore. And, you know, I, you know he was figuring it out, typical thing. But at some point, you know, he left. I didn't see him again. And then, you know, maybe six months later or a year later, I get a package. And in the package is a note from him saying, I think it's time for you to really think about the truth. Here's the truth. And he sent me a book, a book of Mormon, right? So he jumped back in. Good for him. Mm-hmm. No problem with that. But I didn't really want the book of Mormon. I mean, what am I going to do with it? So I just put it down my desk. My desk is like, you know, it's like I'm recycling stuff. So at some point I did an interview for a fanzine and we were sitting in my office and the fanzine and the person interviewing me, without mentioning it to me, like took note of the Book of Mormon. So that became like in the article he wrote, he's like, I think I've got this figured out now. Makai's a Mormon. <laughs> and I realized, oh man, people are looking for clues. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not interested in that. Like I'm not interested in like the, like it was, sometimes people just send me stuff. I just have stuff like anybody else. And it's like, I don't want that to become part of, um, if people are constructing a profile of me, like the FBI or something. Yeah. I just want, I don't want to feed their the thing. Like, you know, obviously I have no, I don't, I no ill will towards this kid yep. or the Mormon church for that matter. Um, I'm not a Mormon. Yeah. I was given a book of Mormon. It does not explain why I wrote the song straight edge. <laughs> That's right. And you hate that too, don't you? Right. What just drives me, I think, again, it's like the, the sense that people are trying to come to, they, they can't accept the idea that maybe somebody just felt something and wanted to sing about that. When did you start to realize that the narrative around you was bigger than perhaps, or was was beginning to belong to other people? Like this Ian Mackay, Discord, Fugazi, Minor Threat thing was somebody else's now. Oh, um, I say pretty early on, um, I mean, Discord, our first record came out in December of 1980. Um, and, uh, we started touring, we, you know, Meyer Threat did try to do a tour, we tried to do a tour, didn't make it all the way, we made it halfway, we made it to Madison, Wisconsin, (laughs) but, um, that's a funny story, but the, uh. It was 1982, really, I think, <clears throat> you know, 19, December of, well, Meyer Threat played for the first six months of, uh, or seven months of 1981, and then Lyle, the guitar player, went to Northwestern University. He left, he qu- quit the band, or he went to college, so we broke up. Um, as a side note, he went to Northwestern, and he shared a dorm building with Steve Albini and Nate from Urge Overkill, totally coincidentally. <laughs> Um, <laughs> That's amazing. At Christmas, uh, the Bad Brains had done, in this fall of 81, the Bad Brains went across the country. And I went to go see them play at the 930 Club in December of 81. And I was talking to HR, the singer, and HR said, man, you you know, Meyer Threat's got to get out to LA. And I was like, well, we broke up. He's like, oh, man, well, you got to get back together because, man, you, you started something. You got to go out there. You got to go. You, they got questions. You got to go send them some answers. I was like, oh, okay. Like, wow. That was, you know, I mean, it was like, I was surprised to hear this. And um, Especially coming from a guy like HR. Yeah. So then Lyle, Lyle was home from college and Brian was around. He was been playing a government issue. So I said, you know, HR says we should like get back together. 
because people want to see us in California. <laughs> and, and then Lyle said, well, I hate school. So it was just decided that we would, um, he would go back for another semester. He came back at Easter anyway. He dropped out in Easter. And uh, we went across the country. And we went across the country. We would get to towns and we kept running into people who identified as vintage, the vintage movement or the curved edge move, movement, mm-hmm. yeah. which I think it's worth pointing out that those movements, um, the counter movements existed before. There was no movement that was a straight edge movement, but it was a counter movement, which is often the case, by the way. Right. Like the thing, a lot of times things that exist, like that people think of as iconic or movements, movements, a lot of times those things are actually, they're fashioned by, um, and I'm fashioned by the people who are against them. Mm-hmm. They're actually created by opponents. Um, like I have been assailed by people, my name, people have written, have said really mean things about me or said mean things about me. And their position is, if I say to them, like, well, that wasn't very, that hurts my feelings. They're like, well, no, no, dude, it's not about you. It's about like people who think you're a God. I said, yeah, but the very fact that you would be so ugly about me, it suggests that I'm like, I can't feel pain. I said, you don't throw rocks at people. You throw them at statues. And you're throwing rocks, so you're making me into a statue. You're creating the God. Do you follow me? 100%. And I think that's sort of the... Do they follow you? I don't know. It doesn't yeah. matter. I just... <laughs> but the point is, like, those... Um, the, the, like, the God, the, that part... And also, in my mind, there's never been a time where I thought, I'm a God, mm. ever. And I don't actually think people believe I'm a God. I think that... That is, people might say that, like, oh, he's like a God. But if I told them to jump off a building, they're not going to do that. No. They're not going to listen to me. So I think that what they're really talking about, and what they're really talking about is the power that they felt in, out of music. And at this moment, like, like the music I made has affected, or music I've been a part of has affected them in a way that was very powerful. And so they use very strong language to sort of impart the significance of music in their lives. And they, and they've assigned, perhaps assigned that to me. They certainly have. And I, I, I might suggest that it goes a little bit beyond just the music. It's, you seem to be the guy that did it right for the right reasons, held on to the ethos, not didn't grow, but it wasn't just that we loved minor threat or we loved Fugazi. It was the community that you sh- valued and that you encouraged made other people feel like, oh, I can be a part of this community. It wasn't just great records. It's what you represented, which I think is really interesting. I think I really believe in the idea of community through inclusion as opposed to community through exclusion. So there's different approaches to this, but my sense was I wanted to be welcomed into something, so therefore I try to welcome people. So I hope I, you notice like when you arrived, yeah. like I try to be like, Welcome, like come you're an amazing in, you know? host. Yes, right. absolutely. So, you know, but did you, was there a point in your life when you felt like you weren't welcome? Did you were you bullied as a kid? Were you ex? Were you were you um, kept out of places you wanted to be in? I can't say that. I mean, I mean, probably there's you know, um, all of us when you grow up, you always have a sense of like the larger world being a little bit of an like, what is this? How do I fit? Who am I? That kind of thing. Um, I think probably my in my life growing up in Washington D.C., it's a kind of an unusual city to grow up in, mm-hmm. um, especially in the '70s. It was you know this the city was um, it was going through some rough times, and uh, and you know it was a certainly it's like it was a black majority city. Seventy percent. The P Funk was calling it Chocolate City. Chocolate City, right? Yeah. Um, and I and I and my experience as a kid was one of like, I felt a serious affinity with the city, but then again, like to a lot of the other kids who grew up here who were not white, they didn't see me as part of their city, you know, right? So I think there's probably maybe somewhere in, somewhere in there, there was a sense of wanting, feeling a connection, but not realizing that I didn't really, I couldn't belong in a weird way or something. Um, maybe there's some, maybe, I don't think, I don't think I ever felt excluded though. I don't think that, I didn't think it was like, um, but there is obviously in high school you run into that kind of situation where there are people who are, or you know, there is that kind of friend thing where you feel a little excluded. I guess. I think maybe I just think it's nice to be nice. I don't know. 
Maybe that's what my idea was. Like, just to be nice to be nice. I don't think it was like, oh, I got, you know, as a kid, I was, you know, spanked by a bunch of bullies. No, it wasn't like that. It is literally like, I don't want to be a bully. Do you think it's free will? Do you think it's just your brain chemistry? I guess. I don't know. I don't think about it like that. I just wake up, <laughs> do the work. Yeah, but I mean, yeah. if, if we were to think about it, what I mean is like this idea that if it wasn't you, would it have been somebody else? If it wasn't you and your friends in making this record, would somebody have come along and created the same community that you guys? I'm sure they have other places, and they did. But here in D.C.? I don't know. That's, I don't, I mean, for me to say it's not possible would mean that what I did was not possible, right. or the thing that we did was not possible, or the thing that, so uh, I say, of course. Like, it's always happening. There's always yeah. the new, you know, there are always people creating something. And I don't think, I mean, while I do think that we have an unusual, you know, circumstance here, um, it's not, it's not, sing, it's purely singular. I mean, there, I think there must be other places. I've go around, I travel around the world, I've met incredible human beings and who are doing fascinating things. Their lives are, you know, they're, they're a gift, you know, it's great. So I feel like, I feel that way pretty strongly about, I don't, I just think, I just hope that like, it'd be like, like when you go from station to station, you like to arrive and someone to say, can I make you a cup of tea? You know? (laughs) And my experience is when I travel, people are like, can I make you a cup of tea? So if people come to my door, I'm like, may I could make you a cup of tea? Right. And it makes everybody feel like, well, because we can affect positive change if we feel like we're in this together. We are in this together. Right. Well, people have to actually... Do it. I think most people do. You do? I do actually. Yeah. I think most people do it. You're, I think that the I think that this notion that the world is is um everyone's so fucking lost in their thing, maybe. I don't really think I think most people are just trying to live well and do well. And if they have opportunity to be kind, they will be. Do you think a big part of what was happening when you were when you guys were starting all this stuff here that you're talking about the end of the Carter era, the the Reagan stuff, like DC was a hot place. And very controversial because the politics that was being sold to us publicly, you guys learned firsthand, wasn't true. The city was divided. This country was divided. You know, the Reagan thing, Reaganomics didn't work. <laughs> Trickle down didn't work. Hmm. Do you think that all those environmental factors played a role? I mean, maybe on some, I used to always say you have to talk to the sociologist about this. From our point of view, like we, like I, and I still feel this way. The federal government is just a giant factory down the bottom of the hill, just churning away and filling the place with smoke. Like it's just a business in town and I can hear it and occasionally I see it, but by and large it has nothing to do with me. So I see the, I just did that stuff like Carter and Reagan. People often say, well, Reagan was really the reason behind hardcore. I don't agree with that at all. It gives that guy way too much power. <laughs> like why, why bonus, why give him that kind of like positive rating? Like, you know, like he, it's always a matter, it's a business. It's a structure. The person at the top is, is the CEO of a giant business. It's money, 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 money. It's all it ever is about is money. Right. And so. But that's not a cynical point of view in your mind, is it? I don't think so. I'm just aware of it. Yeah. You know, I'm just aware of it. So I always feel like, I think I went to DC public school. So my sense was sort of like, you learn, you know, a couple of different lessons one is, you know, to be patient because, you know, you're going to have to wait till they're ready. The other thing is never ask for permission because the answer is always no. That's just a bureaucratic standard. Mm. A bureaucrat says no because he or she doesn't want to have to deal with something if you, if you did it wrong, if something goes wrong. So it's safer for them to say no. So my feeling is like if you ask for permission, you know, then you say they say no, then you're just out of luck. So we would just say, okay, well, we're not gonna like find, we're not gonna ask for permission to be in a band. We're not gonna follow any of the the rules of being in a band. We're not gonna like, you know, get a manager, or whatever. We're not. We're gonna start a label. How do you start a label? You start a label. That's how you start a label. You decide like we're gonna put out this record out. So you send some money to a pressing plant. You send them a tape. Yeah. You get a box of pieces of plastic back. Yeah, you know, but, and you make the records. But what's even wilder about your reality is you have this record label that this wild legacy of introducing a lot of us to so many great bands, and you didn't have contracts. Not or a single lawyers. contract. Yeah, none. Now I know that because it's just the way you do yeah. it, and this is great. If you were able to separate yourself, do you see how unique 
and strange that might sound to some people. Yeah, I can. But I also think what's interesting to me is that I see the inverse, which is it's so weird to me that someone wants to make something. Like imagine if you were to you know, invite people over for dinner yeah. and then you had to make them all sign an agreement. It changes the nature of the meal, right? If they yeah. have to sign like a, a non-disclosure, or, you know, <laughs> like the, or like you know, or a, li- a waiver of liability in case you you know you burn the roof of their mouths, or it's just it's just not the way. It, to me, that's insane. But right. the same way I look at like records, like people, like for instance, people say a band <clears throat> tours. You tour behind a record to support a record. I think it's insane because that makes the record. The apex, that's the point where it's just a, it's a, it's, it's just a commodity. It's a product. The records promote the tour because the music, the live part, that's what it should be. So to me, the, most of the things that are accepted as common knowledge are the, are reversed, but they're reversed by the marketplace. But what's amazing was how far ahead of the curve you were on this because after file sharing and everything came into the record business and people started to realize that the value of the product was gone based on their business models, right. suddenly everybody started to say now, oh, this is just a calling card for my tour. Right. And that's what had to happen. I would business- be ahead of the curve if I was having a race, but I'm not having a race. Right. And you've never been that. No. They can do what they want. I just want to be on. I feel like I've never been interested in trying to stop the record industry. I don't. They can do what they want. I just think it should, we should be allowed to do things differently too. Right. To create our own way. You know, there's... There's an interstate, right? The interstate is quick and it'll get you to New York fast. Like you'll drive back to New York today, right? That is definitely the fastest way to get to New York. Yeah. It's fast, it's straight, it has predictable um, uh, rest areas with predictable food items and yeah. stuff. Um, and it costs you a little bit of money, but boom. Yeah. There are other ways to get there. Small roads mm-hmm. that are winding and they take quite a bit longer but you see more interesting things yeah. and you have more of an opportunity to have a conversation. You and might a richer, run and a richer experience. It's a different experience, you know, it doesn't mean, and I drive on the interstate, so I'm not saying don't yeah. ever do it, but I do think it's weird when it comes to, it comes to music for, or art or expression for me. It just, the, the marketing aspect of it is, it just kills it for me. I'm just not, I'm not, <laughs> not interested in it. But well, you were never about the pursuit of wealth. That was never your thing or well, this labels thing. No. Why? Well, why would I be? Why you know? That seems like it just seems so boring, right? But it becomes yeah. the thing that everybody thought about. And I think maybe it's because of, especially in the seventies, the really big bands, and they saw the lavish life. You know, you know, notwithstanding what the Beatles were doing in the sixties, but people saw trappings, and most people, you know, in our in our culture, have been raised and conditioned to think that you need money for stability or whatever, and that money buys you something. But it just never seems to be a part of this discord thing. I mean, we do need to have money to to buy food. I mean, that's yeah. the agreed upon, like that's the that's the, game, the right? premise we have yeah. in our in society. Like that's like we aren't we aren't like growing food and trading it for you know wood. Yeah. You know, we are actually <laughs> we've 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 put in we've put in a intermediary currency. What to what you know? Literally a currency. Like we do one thing to, and we and we trade these pieces of paper or whatever plastic, whatever it is we we're trading now. <laughs> you know whatever the thing is. But that's like the the way we set up our we structured society. Um, and I don't I don't have a problem with that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the the issue I run into is that this idea that we should like everything we should be making as much money as possible. Um, and I feel like that the ills of the world largely can be laid at the feet of greed. Like it seems to me clear, like that, you know, the issues, almost every issue, I mean, there's obviously like there's religious issues that seem to play, play, have a lot of problems, but (laughs) they cause a lot of problems. But even I suspect that even those issues, the religious, the faith issues, there's a business, there's a money component to that. Like, you know, the control of the oil fields or whatever, yeah. that sort of stuff. So, so I think that, that I guess I feel like it seems so clear to me that there's, um, the greed is, has done such terrible things to the world. And, um, I can't fix that. Um, but I don't have to participate in it. I think that it's possible to be 
like a reasonably a nice a reasonable person and be wealthy. Yeah. But to be rich, you have to be an asshole. And what I mean by that is if this moment, like the four of us are standing here or in the case of, or not that these two people are over here, but the two of us are here and a dollar, a hundred dollar bill suddenly appeared and dropped on the table, equal distance between you and I, like I could grab and say, well, that's mine. Yeah. Because that's how you get rich. You take money that could be anybody's and you take it for yourself. Right. And for what reason? It landed right between us to be, you know, you could be reasonable and wealthy, but to be rich, you got to be an asshole. You right. got to, and if you're not, you hire the people who are assholes. So is that? That's what I wonder. Is that human yeah. nature? Is that conditioning? Is that like why are we like that? Sure. I have no idea. And why are you like the way you are? I have no idea. Did was did your family raise you in this way to think I about guess these so. things? I suppose so. We never. There was never any emphasis on making money in my family. That's for <laughs> damn sure. Uh, you know, I think my parents. I used to always tell people, oh, my parents were really supportive of us. Like, you know, and they, I didn't realize it until years later, that was code for they paid my rent, yeah. which is definitely not the case. If anything, it's the other way around, you know. Yeah. When I say supportive, it's my parents said to me, you should do what you think is right for you. And if you have music, what you want to do, do it. But just make sure it's right for you. Do the right thing. And I'm assuming you're like that as a father. I think so, but I think I am, but I have a 10 year old, so he hasn't really, those questions haven't exactly come up, but of course, I, as far as I'm concerned, I, which the most important thing about raising a kid is to give a kid the, the tools to figure it out because I'm not them and I won't be, you know, I'm not good. Their lives are their lives. So I feel like my parents did give me some good tools to right. figure shit out. And if you do that for your kid, that's the best you can hope for in a way. In that I they take so, over yeah. from there. People say, you used to ask me years and years ago, like decades ago, but for long before I had a kid, they said, if you could teach your child only one lesson, what would it be? And it took me a while to think about it. I said, oh, that it's okay to be wrong. Because if it's okay to be wrong, then you can change. Right. But if it's not okay to be wrong, if you always have to be right, then you can't change. What's so if you get yourself involved with a really terrible like practice or behavior or people and you, and your mind, like I'm right, I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. You can't see the, but if you're wrong, like, you know, shit, I've gotten a situation where I'm like, well, this is not right. I don't want to be a part of this. I'm changing. You can grow. Of course. Yeah. We all can grow. We live in this yeah. strange punitive culture, this cancel delete culture, where if you make, if you What'd put you call a, it? No, a, what? It's, it's a like. Cancel delete? Cancel delete. Like if Cancel some, delete. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Somebody tweeted something 15 years ago, 10 years ago, I guess, because of Twitter. and Oh, that business, yeah. Or anything in your past, people aren't given the opportunity to grow anymore. And I get why. I get why there is that, you know, there's privilege and people have been getting away with bad behavior for a long time. Mm -hmm. And so there's payback. I get that. And there's growth. But it's this ability to let somebody become a better version of themselves that seems to have changed. I think technology, <clears throat> I used to say that, that, that our culture is stoned on technology. Um, in the 70s, everybody's just stoned on pot, you know. <laughs> um, I think the 80s, they were stoned on money. 90s, I don't know what they were stoned on, but certainly in the 2000s, they were stoned on technology. Um, and I think that there's a the – tech, technology and humans don't – they don't advance at the same rate. World War I was a – particularly a horrendous affair because it was the, the, the participants were behaving as if they were still on horses with swords, but the technology was these like incredibly deadly destructive devices. So these guys were like marching, literally running into like oceans of bullets and being just laid to waste. That's an example of a like in like not that any war is ever balanced, but that's a particularly unbalanced war, you know. And I think that technology now, like the internet, the, the, the um, I feel like people haven't quite cottoned how to actually navigate it. So that's so we're in a weird state where anything you do can be suddenly splayed open, right. and then picked apart or examined it's 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 weird that's a very it's a weird thing and yes you're right i mean there's on the one hand there's certainly people who have done stupid things 
that just are stupid things. And I, I actually have never met a person who didn't do a stupid thing. Um, and there's other people who are just serial offenders and they got caught out, you know, yeah. or it's a type of person. I don't know. But I do think it has to do with the development. The humans haven't figured out yet exactly how to contend with the echo chamber, like this instant memory, like the history, all history at our fingertips. I mean, I think it's played a real role. Like culture has been compressed. If you think about, like I've often talked about this, it, I mean, people still are interested in minor threat, which is, I'm very happy about that. I mean, I can say that I deliberately, when I wrote the songs of minor threat in 1981, 82, those songs, the lyrics I wrote for those songs, I deliberately left out any proper nouns, anybody's names, because I was trying to sing about being a kid. Mm -hmm. And I knew if I sang, you know, James Watt or Ronald Reagan or whoever, that that would instantly pin it to a certain era. I also would never waste my lyrics on Reagan. Like (laughs) people are fuck Reagan. Like, come on, what a waste of a song. Um, (laughs) But so I was really deliberate, but I wasn't thinking like, Oh, this is going to go on for a decade. I just wanted to be like, this is about being a kid. I felt like that was a universal thing. So I'm very happy that there's still people and young. I might, I don't know what people, not just like a bunch of 40, 50 year old people who are like, you know, oh, minor threat, but literally kids who still like minor threat. It's yeah. great. Um, but if you go back to 1981, when I was, when we were playing, and if you were to try to make a corollary, right? So that was, 1981 was almost 40 years ago, but let's yeah. call it 35. Yeah. So now subtract 35 from 81. And you get 46. Yeah. And we were not listening to Mitch Miller or or any of those guys, the big band guys. No. It would never it seemed so distant, so sepia toned, right? Like it was beyond, it was like, you know, it just was so out of reach. It seemed so long ago. Even like Hendrix in that would have seemed I mean, I, I, I marvel at the fact that I was in my first band like l- less than nine years after Hendrix died. Yeah. At the time, it might have well been like a hundred, might have, like Lincoln and like Lincoln, Jefferson, and Hendrix. It was like so, <laughs> so seems so historical to me. And there, and I think part of the reason that history has been collapsed this way is has to do with the internet. I think that that having the and and I'm not saying that I'm not a luddite. Yeah. And I'm and I'm I'm not cynical about it. I'm not um, I'm not sentimental and nostalgic. I just literally am observant. Um, I think that it's a miracle in many ways. I love being able to find like, oh, this is fascinating. Here's that thing I was reading about, or you know, um, or if I'm reading a book and they reference some particular song, I can go hear the song. It's a dream come true for me, you know. Um, at the same time, it's pulled people, I think, out of this sort of almost necessary gathering, like that. It's, human beings need to form little hives together. Um, and that this is it's 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 making it challenging for people. It's hard. Scenes are hard to make, and I and I don't I actually don't think a scene, like an internet scene, is not the same thing. It's not, is it? I don't think so. I don't. But I mean, I don't know. I'm just saying. People often talk about community, like social com- social media communities and stuff like that. But man, what a lonely community! <laughs> it was just you and your phone. I, yeah, you know? I think you need to have places where all ages. Uh, shows can happen so kids can show up when of they're course, 14 yeah. yeah, and they need to be a part of a place where they feel safe and welcome and free. And to see each other. And to see each other. And to smell each other. When I interviewed the Beastie Boys, they were talking about how they would go to these punk rock shows, sneak into these punk rock shows in the early 80s in East Village and they saw some other kid who really intimidated them and that kid ended up being MCA. Right. And that's how they formed. Right. Because they saw each other, they found they had similar values. Right. Just from the music. What's amazing about the internet for for for, for your stuff is that for if you're a big Fugazi fan, uh-huh. I mean, you yourself are document. I mean, you have an unbelievable collection of everything from, that you've worked on, but people can see it online. Like Fugazi Live, there's a thing. Right. Well, we had this, you know, Fugazi, when we started playing, the first show we played was September 3rd, 1987. We played at the Wilson Center here in Washington, D.C. And a friend of ours, Joe Picuri, um, Joey P., um, he had done sound. And he said, like, he and this friend of Seth Martin were like, oh, we're, 
we'll do sound for you guys. And they taped the first show, which was nice to have a tape of the first show, sure. just to hear it. And then every time we do a show, they would just tape the show. Then when we started touring, we'd go out and people say, hey, do you mind if I tape the show? And I said, no problem. Just can I have a copy of the tape? This is my natural archival archivist soul. Right. I just, yeah, sure. So they just send me the tapes. And then in 1990, Joey... One, he, he, he's a mixer, and we said, you know, we asked if he wanted to go on the road with us just so we have a sound person. And he said, sure. And then he said, will you buy me a brick of tapes to record the shows? I'm like, sure. So we bought him a <laughs> yeah. giant thing of Maxell, you know, XL, gold, whatever, to, you know, those, you know, tapes. And he just, every night we'd play and he would record the shows. Um and in the beginning, the idea was sort of just roughly to have sort of like, we could hear this what the song sound like. We didn't have a record out. You yeah. know, Fugazi played for um, almost a year with no recordings available. We just played. Um, we thought it was important to become a band before we put a record out. Otherwise, people would just think of it as the new Meyer Threat or something. Yeah. So we wanted... People may have still thought that, but we knew different like because we've been to, we've been on the road. We knew who we were. Was that what it was about finding an identity and because it's fi or figuring what the voice it's about of the becoming, band is? It's about becoming a band, yeah. And so instead of, I mean, obviously I was well known because I was from Meyer Threat, to get it, which Ian's new band. Yeah. But if we go on the road and we tour, we would know that we were a band, and we didn't really matter what anybody else said. Doesn't matter at that point. Um, so the record came out, I think, in a. Oh, it was actually it was a solid year we played. We did a U.S. tour, two U.S. tours, and a European tour with no records. It's great. It's, it's playing amazing. crazy little spots. Um, anyway, it was you know it was, it was insane, but it was it was a it was a great experience. And so anyway, Joey started touring with us, and he just started taping the shows. So we had these tapes. And it, and then at some point we just had to tape the shows because we had a, we already had like fifty tapes or hundred yeah. tapes. When the band stopped touring, you know, I had boxes of these tapes in my closet. None of us listened to these tapes. Like, what was the point of them? Now, there was <laughs> a period of time around the early 90s where we had thought about this idea that we would make them available. And the idea was that we would put an insert with the records that would list all the shows we've recorded. And then people could say, oh, I want a copy of that. And they would send us five bucks or whatever. And we would make a one-to-one -one copy. That is crazy. Crazy. And we already were... I mean, we didn't have a manager. Like, we managed ourselves. We booked ourselves. We did all of our own gear stuff. We did all the driving, everything. So that was like an extra step. I was already busy enough as it was. The idea of us actually cranking out one-to-one -one tape copies, forget it. Yeah. Um, so then it just they just sat there in the closet for years and years and years. And we just kept – and we thought, man, we'll do a live record. And then we, we really – we talked about that for quite a while. But we couldn't – the criteria was like, – do you, is the criteria should it be the best sounding? Like in terms of quality, sound quality, the best performed? Right. The most interesting? Because a lot of times the best sounding and the best most performed is, is not the most interesting. Sometimes the most interesting recordings, I think, are the ones where there's something going on, where like the stage is being attacked by skinhead or there's a, a you know, a, the wall falls in or something happens, you know. Those are the most interesting thing because that's real life, you know. They, right. And we were really interested in that as a band. We never used a set list ever. Our thing was always like we play as we are responding to the moment. Is everybody in the band the same way? Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. That's who we are. So that's just how we operate. So we were like, that's what we do. And so um, so then we have all these tapes. And then the internet, it's like a miracle because suddenly when speeds catch up, it's like suddenly we can have one source and an infinite number of copies. Yeah. So and that that you know, that was we did do a short run of CDs of some shows, like 30 shows we put on CD, but the plastic involved was just didn't feel good. And you can't really, we we're going to press like 10,000 of each one. We didn't, but this is one. And there's probably, I think there's 850 shows available now. There's probably another 50 or more to put up, but, and there's some that have been downloaded many times. And I think there's probably some that have never been downloaded. And but, are those the ones that you like? I don't know. I haven't listened. I mean, I just, it just, I don't know why some shows, people don't seem to be interested in certain shows. But you're not a sentimental guy. No. Except, except living or working in a place where you're surrounded by all of this history 
But also a big part of what you do is you're, you're documenting these things, you're organizing, you're archiving them. Do you ever sit back and listen to a show? Do you ever have any of those feelings like, oh, that was, that was really fucking cool or that was a really interesting kind of feeling? And do you feel something? Uh, I certainly listen. There's certain, like I'll listen. I don't listen to whole shows, but I, like, like today when we were upstairs, I played you a little bit of something. Yeah. I mean, I te- I hear you know when I and also I edit them a lot. I do editing out of a lot of them, so I've certainly heard things. Yeah. I do like the between song stuff that makes me laugh. There's a, <laughs> often some really f- great exchanges. I could have played you some really f- f- hilarious ones. Um, actually, somebody did somebody. Well, somebody took. They went through the first like hundred shows we put up, and they took all the between song banter and they made a ninety minute or forty five minute thing you can download you can listen just it's just between right. song stuff it's pretty great well that's the secret for guys you are funny yeah i think so yeah but then you know there's there's a, gr- a theater group in new york who did a, an entire play using that as a script the, the between song banter <laughs> and that is a script of the play and the the music in the play is the actual the tuning and all the errant noises we made between the song they actually notated them and they did. They did a performance. Uh, what the hell is it called? I feel bad. I got to figure out the name of it because they're very nice people. Right. But they actually they performed it. In num- they performed it in a number of places. Um, so weird. I love it. It was such a totally weird thing to do. It is a weird thing to do. But I, it, I'm assuming they were fans of you, right? Yeah. Well, at least one of them was. So this idea that the other people, I think, were just theater people who didn't really know. They just were. It was like it's, it's avant opera or yeah. avant theater. Today we're doing Swift. God. Tomorrow we're doing Mackay. What the hell is it called? So weird. I'm sorry that I can't because they're such. I thought they were really visionary, and I would just it made me laugh like hell seeing it. Just seeing, hearing them, it was so disorienting because it was my word being yelled back at me. But it was so surreal. Um, because yeah, you know, often do you have that done? Well, you know, it doesn't. It's the right. first time I've ever heard of that. <laughs> uh, so then, um, but to answer your question, there are moments where like I'll find there's certain songs we did that had, um, there would be um section to the songs that are a little more improv and you can get it. I, I can kind of get a sense of where we were at listening to those sections, mm-hmm. whether we were feeling a sense of like where we were feeling like a sense of patience or if we just want to get up and out of there or whatever, like, cause it, it can stretch out. The song could be like a song, like say, shut the door suggestion. It could be, you know, four minutes long or it could be 12 minutes long, depending on where we're at, you know? And, um, or promises. That's another one that were things or glue man. Those songs they have this they 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 have this accordion sort of aspect to them, depending on how we're feeling. Um, and occasionally I'll hear things and I'll I think wow that is really good. I mean you got to remember I was in the band, so I don't ever I didn't. Right. It, it takes years to actually realize to listen to it from an external point of view. Um, and I'm like wow that is we're we're that's a good show. We were playing well that night. And I might and I and, if, and I've, usually if it's funny stuff. Or crazy weird stuff. I'll send it. To every, I'll, I'll send the clip to the other guys in the band. Like, get a kick out of you know. Yeah, it's hilarious to us. But it's also sometimes like there's like some very weird, almost dubby psychedelic stuff that we got into that I don't even remember doing. And it's fascinating to hear that. And the guys are all, you're all friends. That's of course, yeah. Well, we're a family. I, mean, I know they're my closest friends. Those guys are super tight, and we're all. I mean, again, like Brennan and Joe both live here. I see them regularly. Guy's in New York, so we don't get to see him as often, yeah. but we are seriously connected. That's a really special thing to have. Yeah. But it's interesting that we were talking about this before about how you have co- you you have come to represent this thing. You can't just go and walk around. You're saying it with the skateboarding even, right? It's like, oh, fuck, there's Ian Mackay. You're constantly mm. Ian Mackay from... Pick a band, pick a label. Right. But you're, and that's, I don't get the sense you're always comfortable with that. I mean, I'm, I'm comfortable with it, but it's like, <laughs> I, just, I mean, I am what I am, you know, I just, but I think like, for instance, like one thing that's a challenge for me is going to small shows. Yeah. And it's twofold. I mean, there's a, if I go to a small show, it's can be hurtful if I leave. So, oh my God, Ian McGuire hates our band. Right. Yeah. And this happens. And I, so I, I just don't go to small shows usually because it's too notable. My absence is notable if I leave. And I have to leave sometimes for, first of all, I give at 5.30 in the morning usually. 
So I might go to bed late. I don't sleep very much, but I have a kid and I can't stay out till like two in the morning. Yeah. Um, so I might leave, but not because I'm mad at anybody or I don't, mm-hmm. it's just literally because I came, someone asked me to come see their band. I go see them. They played, they're done. I have to go. Right. I don't mean any offense to anybody after that. So, but if you're in a small, so a small show like that, sometimes like I'm, my presence is noted. Yeah. And therefore, my absence is as well. And sometimes I would never, ever want to hurt somebody's feeling by making them think like, well, he didn't want to see my band. The other thing is that sometimes um, at small shows, people are like, it affects them. Like they get nervous or something. And it, I kind of screw the screw up the party. Like everyone's just having a perfectly good time that I walked in, you know? <laughs> and I this seems weird to me. I, I've never, like, it's ironic because my whole thing has always been, I'm just a normal person doing about my business, right? Um, and I'm not trying to, um, I'm just trying to be myself. And so like the whole thing about punk is, like, there's, is that we are all one thing. But, you know, I've been doing it for a long time. I'm a lot older than a lot of the people who are going to house shows, for instance. Yeah. I'm recognizable. And as a result of other people's fashioning and their careful sculpting, I've become a legend. But I didn't make myself a legend. No, but you did a lot of the right things, and I think that's why that happened. I just did the things. I don't know. I, to me, I understand what you're saying, but yeah. people say like you just did everything so right. I don't know. I just worked. I just did. I don't know. Like people say, right. like how do you? How did you know to do that? And I say like, I just looked at the options. I thought about it. Well, this is a big thing for you. It's like thinking, right? Right. People got it. That's why you get all the well, all the, the straight edge grief you always talk about is the fact that. People forget the key part about that song is you just think. You're just thinking, right? Yeah, exactly. You're just trying to, just trying to. I think actually, is if and the out of step is the song that they really knock people out because I wrote, I said, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't fuck, but at least I can fucking think. And I, to me, it was a quite a simple little, yeah, like it's like a cone or something. Like, but, um, and I used to think that people were upset about the like the, the sobriety component of it or whatever, but really it was the fucking. It's the fucking. Thing. That's what freaked them out. People couldn't understand yeah. it. What do you mean you yeah. don't fuck? Right, but they couldn't understand because. But the thing is, they nobody ever said to me like, "Well, you know, so do you have do you, no fluid intake whatsoever." That the word drink, they could yeah. they could parse that, <laughs> but the word fuck, they couldn't parse. They couldn't figure out what you. Yeah, yeah. They couldn't figure out what does he mean by that. Like it's like. Well, to me, it seemed really clear that, like, as a, a teenage boy and then a young man, that people, men and women, were using sex as a as a, as, a, as like a power to, like a power tool, and and there was a lot of damage being caused by it, and it was con- like conquest or abusive sexual, like predatory stuff. It's like I mean, now it's people are talking about it, but like to me, it was very clear to me then. But this is why people give you legend status because this is what you were doing then. You were having these conversations then. We're people trying, trying met. to have the conversations, <laughs> right. but the uh, but it's, it's, but you know, ironically, it's like it was an, like people. I just didn't didn't occur to me that this would like that line really. It yeah. got in people's head. But, you know, but then I think that I, then at this moment, like, I don't get my back against the wall because I want to argue my position. Yeah. At that point, I almost sort of take a step to the side and go, like, I can't believe it. It's like if you, like, if, you know, it'd be like if you, um, um, you know, you, 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 you go outside and like you like you have a, a match, you like the match, and then suddenly the entire field catches on fire. Like, well, that's a weird phenomenon. Like, I wasn't trying. I just was singing a song. It seemed to me to be a pretty straightforward song. Right. You know, um, and, but it just set it off. And I was like, wow, life is incredible. These Would, people are bugging out over something that's so clear to me. Well, you mean, s- suggestion, you, write, you wrote things then. You even got criticism for being open-minded about feminism at one point. I mean, would you have written that song today? Suggestion? Yeah. Wow. Well, of course or, I would. Yeah. Right. I know every lyric I've ever written, I stand behind. There's not a single thing that I would back down from. I understand there's some contextual stuff. I mean, a song like "Guilty of Being White" I think is very difficult for people to understand that song, mm-hmm. um, and that is interesting because I've thought a lot about in the sort of now the way people are looking at racial stuff now. But like when I wrote this song, like I was being a punk rock kid who's trying to like sing about like why I was wrong to judge people by the color of their skin. But I was coming at it from being a minority. Yeah. And I got, I was being harassed, 
beaten up, robbed, picked on by bullies. And they were, and all bullies seek out the other. And this particular situation, I was the other based on the color of my skin. Right. That was just a reality for me. And I thought it gave me an opportunity to, to point out like why it's wrong to do these sorts of things. And I use really direct, harsh language, like the out of step. You know, it's like it's a little, and, but when I wrote it, I mean, this is what I don't think, again, most people can't really imagine is that, or don't take into account. Now, when I was in Minor Threat, like when I was in the Teen Idols, I was writing to like, my songs were basically directed at 10 people. Right. That's right. That's a small When I was yeah. in Minor Threat, it was directed at like 40 people. Right. People who all lived here. It never, ever occurred to me that the songs, like I wrote a song like Straight Edge. I wrote that in the fall of 1980. I'd never been anywhere, really. My band would not, like, I didn't even put a record out. So it never would have occurred to me that when I wrote this song that I was writing to people in Canada. outside of, yeah, anywhere. It yeah. never would have occurred to me. I just wouldn't, it did, how could it? You know, like, I mean, I've often, I say this in interviews quite often, like, when I wrote those things, it was unimaginable to me that I would be at age 56, sitting in my house talking about it with some Canadian dude, right? Yeah. Like that's just not part of the way your brain works. I just was writing to my friends. So the same way the guilt of being white, I was writing to people who understood exactly what I was talking about. And they said, wow, that's an anti-racist song, which it is. Yeah. But I understand contextually how people can look at it and say, see that as sort of like, oh, that's like an equivalency, a false equivalency, or I get it. I understand that. But I'm not backing down from my point of view, which is racism is wrong. Like, I'm not backing down from that. That's just, you know, that's the way, and that's what to me, all my lyrics, I don't think there's anything I've read, I mean, I stand behind my words, for real. <laughs> when did you realize that words had power, and for a lot of people, they can become self-aware, your songs? So at some point, you're- Oh, well, you know, Meyer Threat was actually a really interesting, because Meyer Threat was the first, here's the thing about Meyer Threat, we broke up in 1983. I mean, that's crazy to me that that's that long ago. Right, and when we broke up, we had our best selling record, which was out of step. We had pressed the first pressing was 3,500 copies, which sold out immediately. And then while we were pressing up the second batch of which was 5,000, that's when we broke up. So at best, our best selling record sold 8,500 copies. I don't think we'd even sold all those 5,000 yet. So that gives you some like now that band, if you it's hard to. If you take all the different formats, because we've released different formats, but if you were to take like the first single and then add in each of the different formats of it, yeah. not counting the digital or the streaming or any of that component whatsoever, we sold almost a million records, which is, that's, you know, approximately 995,000 <laughs> records since we broke up, right? <laughs> so you can see that the spread, the, inf the, 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 that language, I just didn't, I didn't know. Yeah. But as I saw the Straight Edge thing, especially with Straight Edge um, and the other song, the way people respond to that and then this kind of the people who are so opposed to it and then the people who are pro and then like the people who developed movements out of it and took it to like a more militant thing. And I was like, wow, this is really interesting. Like when I got into punk, like the way I wrote was to be, I thought, write as directly as possible. That way you can't be misunderstood. That was my, or misinterpreted. That was my concept. Be direct. Boom. And that way you, it leaves no room for misinterpretation. However, by the time I was in Fugazi, I realized, oh, I'm, that was, I think I was wrong because the reality is that if you make something that's a finished idea, it becomes, it's like a tool and anyone can just use it for their, whatever purposes they want to use it for. Right. Yeah. So, so if it's a finished, I used to say like, like finished ideas, they're like, they're like uniforms then anyone can wear it. Yeah. So I thought, oh, for now on, write, instead of making uniforms, make like high quality fabric so people have something to work with, right? That's a big change. Right. So that was a big, that was a, that was a response. That was like taking the, that was taking the, um, that was something I learned from like writing because it didn't occur to me how people were responding until later. And then I was like, oh, okay, well, I don't want people just to use my words in a way that, like, it's too simple for them. Like, the idea that someone ever got hurt or beat up or killed and somehow, in some way, my music played a role in that, 
like that, that somehow that my the this idea that I had this song I wrote about my life somehow was turned into like a a set of rules that would sub- provide a trigger for somebody who deeply ill with violence. Like if I gave them some rationale, that's never what I wanted to do ever. So we would, change that. We're, you know? tr- which we're trying to figure out if it was Bernie Sanders who said people got to listen to more Fugazi. Like there are people saying like, we were trying to find the quote, but we couldn't find it. There was no rumors floating that. around. Um, but Bernie Sanders, I know that his, when he was a mayor of Burlington, I think his wife or the woman he was living, I don't know who exactly, but she, started this venue called uh, 242 Maine that he was involved with this venue that was like about, it was all ages punk venue in Burlington and Fugazi played there. Yeah, it was cool. They go, oh yeah, yeah. that guy, who's the mayor of Burlington. <laughs> that's right. That was a funny, yeah. Possible presidential yeah. candidate. I, I, I have no, I've never heard that, but it's funny. Do you, um, are you caught up at all in following, I know you are saying that it's the factory down the street it's the factory down the street still. Still, but with, I mean, this is a Trump White House. This is a Pence White House. Yeah. Do you pay attention to any of this stuff? Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I read about it, yeah. Do you go nuts about it or no. you, no? Nope. Nope. I don't. I think, you know, when he, when uh, them got, these guys got into office, I was like, oh, this is going to be a nasty batch of bastards. And I was right about that. Um, <laughs> but, you know, the thing is, I have said, I've said to my friends, because so many people are so miserable. And I said, listen, this is, you know, before the midterm, but I said, like, they got the Senate, they got the House, they got the White House. Don't give them your joy. Like, don't give that up. <laughs> like, don't give up your joy. Don't be miserable. Because if you're miserable, then it's like, what's the point? Like, you know, so my point of view is like, not to be in denial. I'm not in denial at all. Right. But I think that the, 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 what makes people like, if you want to organize, you actually have to, you just want to sit around with people and just be miserable all the time. I think it's more important to be like, okay, let's, let's seek joy with each other. Let's be happy. Let's find let's find people we love and and do that, and that'll make us strong, so we can stand, we can survive this. Because this is the weather, by the way. Yeah. These people are temporary, and this situation is temporary. This I mean, is, the weather can inflict a lot of damage in, in yes, short, it can. short order. And yes, has, it can. But better that you're with other people and organize. Right. Um, so for me, yes, I see. I, I'm aware of it. Um, of course it's troubling. Um, you know, f- I think that, um, when he was elected, people were like freaking out about it. And I said, listen, you know, they said, what do you think? I said, like, well, I said, you know, my, my feeling about that election. And I, I said this, I was like, there's two, two people in a pitched battle for control of the steering wheel of a giant, giant ship. Right. Huge. I mean, this country is huge and the government is massive. Right. <laughs> so, these two people are fighting over control of the ship. One of them would vaguely steer it in the direction you wanted to go in. The other one would steer it in a direction you don't want to go in. The one who didn't want it to win got the hold of the wheel, right? But the thing is that whichever way it gets steered, the truth is the current can't be stopped. The ship is going down and it's always progress. It's going to be a, it's a bummer. It's going to slow things down. Things are going to get wrecked up, but they have been wrecked up, but this, well, this, we're this always moving in the direction of the better. It's going to get, I just feel that's how I look at it, but that's just me. People say, you're, that's crazy. Okay. I don't care. <laughs> well, I think the numbers mm. are borne out that way. Yeah, like, I think so too. The world is getting markedly better in a lot of areas. Yes, I would think so. But I think that, that mostly that as a culture, Progress is the current. Yeah. And the current, it can't be stopped. Like, it can be, you know, again, it should go yeah. sideways. It can be unpleasant, for sure. Um, but all, the people are always stronger. They may not know that, but they are. Um, are you getting sent a lot of punk bands and hardcore bands to sign that um, are reflecting the times? No, but people don't send me stuff like that. I don't, I'm not, this label doesn't operate like that. We've only ever worked with DC area bands and they have to be people we know because yeah. we don't use contracts. So we don't really sign bands yeah. per se. Um, but also I think most people, they, we don't even really put that much new stuff out now because it doesn't really, the way that most young bands who identify as punk band now, they have a whole other idea of how they want to get their, 
message. And I just don't, I'm, I'm just not that way. I just don't right. care about a lot of that stuff. So I think that, um, and I haven't, honestly, I haven't, there's funny, a lot of the bands, there's a lot of band, young band I've met who are really like, they're passionate about this thing, but they haven't, they can't quite figure out how to organize it or whatever. Right. But I think that it'll all come in. And it may not be music that does it. They're, they're, people are doing stuff for sure. Yeah. You know, the main thing is, I always said like, stay safe, stay warm, <laughs> stockpile the food. We're getting through it. It's Ooh, just well. a matter of, it's really a matter of time. I know you got to go see your pops. So we'll, we'll get out of your hair and appreciate your time. But um, this thing between you and Henry Rollins is quite beautiful that you've been friends for so long. Yeah. Here's my first question, which has a follow-up, so I'll telegraph it. Do you think Henry Rollins is epic? How do you define epic? Like, do you look at Henry Rollins and go, that's really, that, like, he's built a really interesting thing, being him. He's a renaissance person. He's he's reached so many people. He's an, He just seems like quite a personality. And I wondered when you first realized that, if you thought that Henry was um, the kind of person who could cut through. Hmm. Well, I met Henry when I was 11. We've known each other for a long time. We've done a lot of time together. Um, Wasn't he one of your roadies on your first, when you went out west? He was. He went with the Teen Idols out to California. But we were skateboarding before that. I and mean, we were 16. I was 16. He was 17. We took a Greyhound bus together alone to California to go skateboarding. And we took the bus back. And that was, you want to get to know somebody. <laughs> um, whew. Um, it's hard to answer your question. Rollins has been through a lot of different, like, manifestations. Like, you know, he was like, you know, the skateboarder, and then he was like the roadie, and then he was an SOA, mm-hmm. you know, and then he was, you know, Henry who was working at the ice cream shop, and then then he was in Black Flag, which that was pretty crazy. That was really weird because he called me up and he said, I remember it was, in, it was May or something of 81, and at that time... Like we were aware that Des wanted to play guitar. We knew the Black Flag people. Yeah. And flip side, which Keith, Keith was gone. He'd been gone. Yeah. It Ron it was Keith, Ron, Des. Yep. Yep. So we met. We they played here in February of eighty one, and actually stayed at my house, my parents' house. They stayed on the floor, slept on my floor, <laughs> in my bedroom, and you know, I always tell people you haven't lived until you come upstairs and see your mom and Robo smoking cigarettes and eating pancakes together. <laughs> um, the best. <laughs> but um. <laughs> Those, but, uh, so we knew those guys and we were calling and talking on the phone all the time. And we, and flip side, we had heard that Dez didn't want to sing anymore. Yeah. And f- so flip side magazine, which was, I think the Bible for us in many ways, they were reporting about who's going to be the new singer for black flag. And they were pitching all these different names like, Oh, maybe so-and-so maybe such right. and such. And then, um, I get this call from Henry. He says, do you hear the new singer for black flag is? I'm like, no, who is it? Who is it? And I was, said, you know, I couldn't figure who it was going to be. And he goes, me. And I was like, I was like, couldn't compute at all because they were not on a tour. Like they came out to try out people and he didn't tell me, I knew nothing about it. He went to New York and sang with them at a show or a a practice or something, but he didn't tell me. I had no idea. They had contacted him. They said, we want you to come up and, you know, and he told, and I just couldn't believe it. You know, it was mind blowing. And then like two weeks later, I'm taking him to the Greyhound station to meet up with him. They were, you know, I think he took the bus to Gray, uh, Detroit or something and wrote, went back to California with him. And you stored his stuff. Oh yeah, of course. I had his stuff because he had no, he had all this stuff. He had, he couldn't take it with him. He left with like a backpack. That's it. Um, and then Black Flag, of course, was really intense era for Henry. Um, and Rollins band. And uh, but I don't know. It's hard to, you I do think of Henry as, I mean, epic, it, <clears throat> it's, it's not a word I would use, but mm-hmm. um, he's a really, he's one of a kind and he's a genius and I love the guy. Like I would love each other so much, I think. And um, I will say that one thing is interesting is an aside is that, you know, I showed you that I have 35 years of correspondence um, and I did putting this organizing and making this archive. I l- sat with this woman, Nicole Prokopenko, who's the archivist I work with. And I went through every letter with her and said like, okay, this is a scene report. This is a band, this person. I know my brain still works. I recognize all these people. Yeah. I know what all these letters are for the most part. Um, she said something really interesting to me. She said that she, she has processed many collections of correspondence. This is the first time she'd ever done one with somebody who's alive. 
And it was fascinating because usually they would just look at a letter and go like, okay, well, who's this person? We have no idea. Let's figure out who the, right. figure out who this person. But I can say, oh yeah, that person used to live at this house down the street. Blah, blah, blah. you know, I can, yeah, um, I can, I can basically name like I, my brain is still there, which is part of the reason I'm doing this now because yeah. it's still there. Um, but the reason I brought this up is that as I was going through a lot of the letters from people talking about their interest in what we were doing, they were saying, we heard about you from Henry because Black Flag, they were out like Johnny Appleseed. They were working. They toured so much and he would talk about the DC scene yeah. and they would write to me because Henry said you should write. So in many ways, like Henry was a huge part of this. I mean, beyond the fact that he like was some of the early bankrolling because he paid for the SOA single mm-hmm. and gave us the money back for that. He's been so supportive of this label. And uh, it was that was really unbelievable. When you see it, when you read through the letters and you're reading through them in a compressed form, right? Like you're not, these are not over weeks and weeks, but right. are, I actually started to see this pattern. Like, oh my God, Henry has played such a huge role in this thing. Um, but I think in recent years, just seeing his... Um, his focus, his discipline, like he's always been disciplined, but it's really intense now. But, and his desire to like, he just wants to, he wants to make money to buy the records and the stuff that he thinks is important. That's yeah. what he wants to do. And he's unapologetic about it. I respect the shit out of him for that, you yeah. know, but also he's my best friend. So it's hard to, <laughs> you know, I don't have to say like, he's just my, like we, I think we both really um, get a kick out of each other. And we understand each other yeah. um, and we understand why we think things are important and we don't have to, you know, it's like I had a friend, I have a friend who's a, who's an old punk rocker and he became a therapist and um, we were talking one day. I said, I wonder if I should ever see a, see a therapist. And he said, oh, you should see me. I go, well, should I see somebody like a, not somebody who knows me? And he yeah. says, yeah. He goes, but if you see me, you wouldn't have to explain why you didn't sell t-shirts. And right. I said, that's the thing, man. The punk thing is like, it's a secret society. Yeah. We don't need, so if you're within that group, you don't need to explain. Most people are like, why would you do that? You know, but most people, we yeah. know why. Yeah. It's like, you know, when you sit down, when you're with other people of like mind, you're just like, you don't have to explain it. Well, and that's the stuff that's not important. You can get to the heart of the matter. Right. So did you end up going to see a therapist? No. You didn't. Do you still wonder if you should? Of course. My <laughs> grandmother, I remember my grandmother, my grandmother, Dorothy, when I was like 16 or 17, she said, you should go see a therapist. I'm like, I'm not crazy. She's like, oh, no, but you're still under your parents' health insurance and it'd be interesting for you to go. She was, I think you'll find it interesting. Yeah. And the truth is, like, I'm probably, I'm probably, like, I, first off, therapy as a, a, formal, a formal thing, I, whatever. It's not, but this conversation itself for me is mm. seeing a therapist in a way. Like, conversation is a way of thinking about things yeah. and processing them. Um, so I think that that's, I, you know, but no, I don't, I don't, it's not that I wanted to see a therapist because I was like, I think I'm cracking up or I don't have to do with my life or I don't know who I am. Yeah. It's rather, I just thought, I wonder if I should see a therapist. <laughs> Literally the same way I might wonder if I want to try, you know, Eritrean food as opposed to Ethiopian food. Right. I just was, he was a ther- he just told me about his work and it sounds fascinating. I wonder if I should see a therapist. You're a curious person. Oh, I'm deeply curious. As you could be evidenced by some of the things I was showing you today. Like it's, it's not, it's not enough that I'm doing the thing. I have to ask why, how does this right. work? And what does this do? And what can, how can I negotiate? How can I navigate that? Or what can I do? Endlessly curious. And that's, I mean, I think that's the way to keep your joy too. But it ties in with the idea of thinking. God forbid. Right? God forbid, right? <laughs> right. You have to be, be curious. You have to think. Right. So like, I think I'm always, I'm always curious. That's, that. that's never ending. I think. DOA, like, <clears throat> That band, there's a really interesting history with them because they were really the first of the underground North American like underground punk bands to come to Washington. They played a place called Madame Zorgan, which was a um, it was a kind of a commune art gallery, but very political. Like a, it was a anarchist kind of place. It was the um, they were, they. Uh, as an anarchist socialist, you know, they were yippie people there and. DOA played, it was October 31st, 1979, they came and played. It's so weird they played there. And I, I mean, and I have to, it's something I have to tell you, it's one of my deepest regrets that I was sick 
and I didn't go to that show. I couldn't go to that show. And I, it's like my brother was there. Henry was there. I mean, all these people went, but I didn't go. Actually, I'm not sure if Henry did go. Now he may have. But anyway, I know my brother was there, but that show was so important. Like we all had the tape, we listened to that tape over and over. And we just, and DOA, like they were the first ones who went out. And I got to thinking about DOA, like how important they were as a band. I mean, aside from the fact they were just a great band. Um, but that they, they did this weird tour around North America and they played these really weirdly political places. Like, and this, and, they, and this is like the, you know, again, like very yippy, um, and, uh, revolutionary, uh, was it revolutionary, um, communist party, RCP. And I think that the guys who they work with, there's a couple of guys who they worked with or who are booking them and managing. I think they came out of that tradition they were part of that late 60s, early 70s radical culture, and they had contacts in these other cities, right? So they were – like they had these shows in New York and Washington, and they did this crazy tour. They pulled it off in 79. Then they go back to Vancouver, and Black Flag makes their way up to Vancouver because they met DOA. And so they make their way up and they play with the Rude Buddha, whatever the venue is. There's some venue in Vancouver. Was and it they the Smiling Buddha? Was it? Smiling Buddha Cabaret? Smiling Buddha? Okay, was it the cabaret at the time? Smiling Buddha cabaret. Well, no, that, no, no, no. Because uh, I remember fifty four forty did a whole thing with the Smiling Buddha cabaret. Yeah, oh, yeah. Well, something. Yeah, anyway, yeah, it was yeah. a vin- they went up to go play in Vancouver. I think DOA was sort of like they came up and Dukowski, black flag bass player, and sort of their genius behind their yeah. their their their, man, their early booking their business stuff. He sat down and said, "Give me all your numbers," and just copied all the numbers they had, right. and then. He started, that was the blueprint for the way he started to book. And then Black Flag started going out and just filling, they just played and played and played. And they would just do, and Black Flag would go out and do like, they do a tour across the country and they come back and they just go right back in the van and do another tour hitting every other city, yeah. right? So they just relayed all these tracks. You know, DOA were the first one to go out and like really kind of like hack out, you know, a trail. Yep. And then Black Flag goes out and they just laid all these like other tracks, they found these new locations because they were getting the access because they had found this original trail that DOA left. And then they would get here and they would give, and I would sit down with Chuck and copy all his numbers. Amazing. And we just copy, and then we'd make photocopies of the numbers and you, you know, hand them to other, every our touring band, say, here's your numbers, call these people. They, if they can't do a show, they can help you find someone to do a show. You just keep trading these lists. But DOA really was like, they're, to me, they're the band that's really started that the under American underground thing. Cause but prior to that, everyone was just playing clubs. Yeah. They were just playing like these like traditional rock. They were being booked by rock, rock agent for the most part. Not everybody, but by and large, a band had toured. That was the system. Right. I mean, the cramps were not like that. Um, there are a few bands that would play these weird, weird venues, but by and large, you saw there's just players playing club dates. And then you have like this, but then Black Flag, you know, DOA and Black Flag. And then after that, it was like, it's what made the North American underground. That's why, you know, Minor Threat goes out and like how we met the big boys or we met all these bands is because we heard about them from Black Flag. Right. Who got the DOA connection. Speaking of bands, you just, your new band just played the church. Right. But what, you have a record. Well, we've had recording. You've you've recording. It's all things, it's all linear, right? How many songs have you got recorded? 11 or 10 or something. 11 songs, 10. Um, you don't have a name for the band? No. Are you going to come up? Are you going to release the album? I, w- I hope so. Are you going to tour the album? Well, the album would promote the tour, remember? <laughs> <laughs> are you going to go on the road? <laughs> How about that? I don't think we'll ever, well, I don't think at the moment, you know, we have a 10 year old son. Yeah. And both of his parents are in the band. Yeah. And we're not going to go out for months. But of course we want to go, we'd like to go play. I like playing music. Would you have short list for names of the band? No. Not, no ideas for what the band could be called. Well, the names have been. It's funny. There's actually, you know, Amy and I were in a band called The Evens for years. So the obvious name would be The Odds. Right. But then I remember years ago, I thought like, maybe they would call it The Odds. So I looked it up and I saw there was some Canadian band called The Odds. Odds, Right. So then I thought like, oh, well, no big deal. Like I didn't think about it anymore. Then when we were getting ready to do the show, I said, we'll just call it The Odds. And I started to think about, I thought about, can I think about things? I thought, I better double check on that thing. So I went back and looked at it and I go, they're still playing yep. and they're called the odds. And I went and looked at their Wikipedia page and it said that they, at one point they had broken up and then they had to re, re, they got back together. They re, put out a record called the new odds because somebody else had used the name odds. Yeah. But then, and this, this is what it said in the Wikipedia text. It said, 
after resecuring their name, <laughs> they got to be the odds again or odds band or whatever they're called. And I thought, that sounds very much like a lawyer was involved. And I don't, it's like, this is the thing that's so weird about the internet. Like, my name is Ian. There are millions of Ians in the world and we can all coexist together. Yeah. But there's something about the name of a band that it instantly becomes like a trademark or something. And then it gets into like litigious, mm-hmm. like you use it. So then the problem with the internet is now it's brought them all to the surface. It's not now that you can, like you can virtually find any, a band called virtually anything at this point. Um, and I don't really care. I don't mind sharing a name. That doesn't bother me at all. The problem is that the other band quite often is coming at it from a really business point of view. Yeah. And they're going to, send their like a, their lawyer or their fake lawyer to you with a cease and desist. And it's just too much of a stupid headache. It's that's a problem with the internet. It's that shit. Everyone just wants to they can just see everything in instantly. Yeah. But I mean, I don't know the odds. Where are they where are they from odds? Uh, they're like too, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. And they actually had a bunch of songs on the radio. I don't doubt it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they know, had a real career up there. You know, for but sure. you know, but there's you know, there's plenty of people named George. You seem to be doing okay. <laughs> so far so good. Yeah, right. Yeah. So I feel like that there's uh but I'm not mad at the odds. Yeah. I mean, and truth, and just to, to give you, to be clear, like I was in a band called Embrace in the yeah. mid 80s. Yeah. At some point, a guy called me, a manager guy from England called me and said, like, I have this band called Embrace. Is that going to be a problem? I said, it's a word, go for it. Yeah. So just to be clear, like I, it's not like I'm suing people for using right. the name. I, I, I'm, I can take my, take my own medicine, but um, it's all right. So I, you we'll might be so. called the odds. No. That's not going to happen. No, it's not worth it. <laughs> That's right. It's just not worth the headache. When do you think you're going to put the record out? I have no idea. There's Maybe no, this no, year. Okay. I hope so. We'll see. Can it's we, good. It's a good record. <laughs> well, when you're ready, yeah. send us a song. We'll play it on the show. All right. We'll yeah. sneak it to the audience. Sure. Thanks. All right. <laughs>